Welcome, everybody. My name is Mikey Mahenna. I'm the executive director of Afikra. Thank you so much for joining today's call. Today's special guest is Todd Rise. Am I saying your name right, Rees? Both are good, actually. <laughs> well, how do you say your last name? I grew up Rees, but it's a mispronunciation mispronunciation of rice. Okay. So, so I'll say it again. Um, <laughs> so uh, our special guest is Todd Rice. He is an architect and writer based in Amsterdam. His recently published book, Shopee City, How Architecture Made Dubai, came out from the Stanford University Press. It explores architecture's packaging to sell Dubai on a global stage. His work has also been featured in The Guardian, Architectural Design, Art Form. He has taught architectural and urban design at Yale, uh, Yale University and Harvard University. Todd, thank you so much. Welcome to our Fixed Conversations. And thank you for inviting me. So, well, you know, I'm really, really pleased to have you on. I love it when we have guests on the program who are also Africa fans who attend these events as well. So it's a real honor to have you on. And I'd like to know, first of all, how did you become interested in studying architecture of uh, architecture period and then the architecture of Dubai more specifically? Um, I have... Um, ar architecture was always a topic that I uh, was fond of, but was kind of nervous to approach. Mm. It took me quite into my uh, 20s to, to dare uh, to do it. So I, um, yeah, I, I studied English literature uh, first, uh, and I was actually working in for the city of New York under Rudolph Giuliani, who we all know now today, yeah. uh, but he was mayor at the time. I was working as a urban planner for the Department of Housing. Uh, and from there, I decided to study architecture. Um, studying architecture then, um, that was kind of the, yeah, like late 90s, turn of the century uh, to the early 21st century. And um, the Netherlands was very hot at the time uh, in terms of, it was a place to be as a young architect. Um, and I started doing, um, internships there over my summers uh, and eventually moved here. Um, and then my work here, uh, working in an office in Rotterdam at uh, OMA um, was how I, I so I, I, I started visiting Dubai, only Dubai um, about 15 years ago, probably 15 years ago this year um, uh, as an architect. So like many architects, that's, that's how I uh, yeah, arrived there. Okay, I'm going to ask you a stupid question. It will not be my last, but okay. My first stupid question is, what is an urban planner, and how can you be an urban planner if you're not an architect? Um, it's not a stupid question. Uh, um, I wasn't, um, and not just because there are no stupid questions. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty tricky. <laughs> um, it's, it's a pretty tricky um, kind of. Thing to go by. I didn't need to show any sort of, um, of documentation. It was, yeah, it was my, I think, no, actually I was a land use planner. I said urban planner, but my official title was land use planner. Uh, but yes, uh, it was, yeah, it's a, it's a bureaucratic title. So yeah. someone decided I could have it. Uh, but that, that, that does, that's not for everywhere. That was only city of New York at, in that decade. Maybe it's different now. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is, um, is your experience coming into architecture not directly? Do you think that it informs the way you look at look at cities, look at work, look at structures? Do you feel like you have an unconventional approach to architecture? Um, I think that I don't think it's very unconventional. No, I think architects generally. Um, I think architects are very much interested in the built environment. Um, they, they want to see kind of how architecture in, is integrated into other facets of life. And, and that mm -hmm. means at, at different scales of life, uh, whether, you know, th there are some architects who say they're interested in building at the smallest and the largest of scales. You should be, you should be warned against them, but nevertheless, that, that can at least be their interest. Um, but no, for sure. I think an, an interest in cities or at, le at least an interest in how, you know, humans build settlement, how humans build community is, is very much part of being an architect. Okay, great. 
I want to shift into the book a little bit. Sure. Um, who's this guy? That's John Harris. <laughs> yeah. So give us a little context about um, how you first became, um, who this person is, when this photo was taken, you suspect, if you can, if you can recall off the top of your head. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, we don't know exactly when this photo was taken. Uh, John Harris's son, Mark, uh, who has, has been really the, the person who has made sure I could uh, yeah, write this book, make this book. He's, he's, he's one who's provided me the access to the archives of John Harris. He uh, estimates, and he's very good at this game of estimating, um, that this was probably taken in the mid 50s and probably taken at the airport in Doha, um, where he had several projects, including a large scale uh, state hospital. Um, uh, John Harris is a British architect. Um, he um, came kind of onto my radar when I was working at OMA, and we were working on an exhibition uh, to, um, to look at uh, um, kind of ongoing urban development in the early 2000s uh, on the kind of southern coast of, of the Gulf. Um, and we quickly found that there was this curious uh, firm that we'd never heard of, John R. Harris and uh, partners, um, who uh, had created Dubai's first master plan uh, in 1960 and goes on to create some of the most, uh, we're going to go, go into them in your slides, I think, uh, some of the most essential work in, in the city. And so in preparing for that uh, exhibition and then subsequently a book, uh, we, re re we reached out to uh, Mr. Harris, who, who was still alive at the time, um, and Mark was actually the person uh, we communicated with the most uh, in terms of bringing a lot of the imagery from uh, his projects to an audience that had never heard of him uh, before. I mean, of course, people had heard of him. Uh, um, people know who he is in Dubai. Uh, but at the time in 2005, 2006, there wasn't a lot to be found uh, published on him. So he sort of serves as the as the protagonist in your in your book. Um, can you describe the Dubai that he arrived to in uh, in 1959, and right. what he expected, um, why he was why he arrived? Sure. So the the two images you have here are taken from on the left. This would have been taken during his first visit to Dubai. Uh, and the second is taken uh, during his second visit when he actually, so the first one he's, he's arrived uh, within about 10 days, I think, or two weeks uh, of being invited finally. Uh, and in the book, I describe this kind of humorous exchange of telegrams where, you know, everyone's kind of stumbling about trying to, to decide on an architect or an urban, uh, urban uh, town planner to, to send to Dubai from and this being the, the British government. Um, and so finally, John Harris gets the job and, you know, quickly makes the arrangements, gets, you know, the, the proper papers, talks to the correct people in London before heading um, to Dubai in November 1959 uh, for meetings, um, not only with the ruler of Dubai at the time, but also with British engineers who are already well established uh, in the city. Um, and then the second picture is actually when he returns uh, about five or six months later, uh, May 1960, uh, to deliver the plan. Uh, and so what was the city like? Um, uh, the, the airport he, he arrives in is in Sharjah. Um, I don't exactly know where he was staying. Um, it could have been he was staying in the, the, the British government's compound, which would have been the political agency. Uh, but he could have been staying somewhere else. They also had a, a house in Dara. Um, it, was a, it was a city that was really still considered two cities, Burdubai and Burdera on either side of Dubai Creek. And this is him again, for, so May 1960, uh, when he presented the plan um, uh, to Sheikh Rashid. 
and that is um, next to him is uh, Mahdi Al Tajir, who was a, a Bahraini um, aide uh, to Sheikh Rashid for a long time. And I think what's can you really give us a sense of? Go ahead. Uh, just ahead. before you jump in, just give us a sense of what the population was like um, in terms of industry and uh, form. You know, what did the city really like look like for those of us who may not be as familiar with Dubai? Sure. Um, it was uh, a city that was more um, so people, more people were living in Arish or Barasi style houses, uh, palm from houses, uh, houses built out of kind of salvage materials from the port. Uh, then the people who are actually living in uh, houses made of masonry or coral and, 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 and earth. Um, so it was a, um, there was very little concrete or, or steel even to be found in the city. Uh, there had just been a, a rather, I mean, for the city of Dubai, there had just been a, a, the largest scale engineering feat ever achieved, um, which you can see a bit in that uh, plan, that kind of line in the water uh, is a suggestion of that. The creek was being literally engineered in a, into a kind of canal so that boats could, could come in. And more boats coming in meant more concrete, more steel was coming in, uh, to, uh, which would have been first infused into the, the port itself, but it would also be translated in, into, into the kind of uh, the fabric of the city, really. Yeah. Um, it was probably a city of about 20 to 30,000 at the time. I want to read a quote that you wrote, um, and I want to have you sort of explain. You say, with a plan, look, talking about this 1959 plan, you say, with a plan, Dubai was going to harden into a recognizable forms of a city. Dubai was already a city, but as of November 19, 1959, it was on its way to being amenable to international financing, global, consul global consultancy contracts, and marketing campaigns. Harris's town plan assured outside observers that Dubai was going to grow, quote, along sound lines. What do you mean by along, along sound lines? Yeah, I think along sound lines is in quotation marks, right? Yeah, it is in quotation marks. So what does that yeah, mean? It's, it's fascinating. This, this term comes up a lot in British documentation, yeah. along sound lines. Uh, and it, you know, it's something that's kind of literal and also metaphorical. Uh, you know, the, the lines of the plan, uh, the lines of, 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 of parceled land, for example, um, that were being literally inscribed into the into the uh, into the land with with um, with ribbon with stakes being placed into the ground and string stretched between them. So this this began to kind of define the city and define the parameters of how it would be built. The beginning of that quote, I think, what's important to know is, you know, this isn't the beginning of a modern city. I think uh, mm -hmm. I'm very careful not to suggest that. Uh, to, su to say that Dubai was not modern before 1959 or before this plan uh, would be ignoring the fact that there was a kind of modern um, sensibility already. Uh, this, you know, the city was keeping itself alive through trade, really. The pearling industry had, you know, had tanked uh, a decade or two earlier. Um, and the only way people knew how to survive was through the kind of wily services of, of trade, really. Um, and that means you're in communication with the rest of the world um, in, a, in a larger region, at least. Yeah. The quote uh, continues, and I think this goes back to the to the title of your book. You say the town plan was also a business plan meant to shape global opinions as much as local contours. Already, the city was focused on outward appearances. Its hired architect knew that appearances appearance was an, as integral as any modern ingredient. Can you talk about your the title of the book, Showpiece City, and why that sort of connects to um, that quote? Sure. Well, before I go to the title, I, I just say that 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 plan, um, the only place that I ever found it published um, is in a pamphlet made by the city of Dubai, Dubai municipality in the mid 1960s. And I, I say that because, you know, it, it, it was a pamphlet made for kind of like businessmen, for investors to kind of come and visit Dubai. And the plan itself was a kind of evidence, you know, 
you might think Dubai looks like this, but this is what we have planned for the future. And so the, the plan itself was this promise of something to come. And that connects to the title, Showpiece City. Um, showpiece is a term that I found coming up through the 60s and the 70s. Um, and you almost feel like people who are using this term, they're searching for the word that we use today, icon. You know, how we talk about iconic architecture today uh, that, you know, shows that, you know, a, such and such city is now on the map. But they use this term showpiece. And I really found that uh, a fascinating term uh, show to show and that it's really kind of about the appearance of the building. But whereas we might talk about arch iconic architecture today, it's, it can be very whimsical, very trendy. Uh, but showpiece was used to describe a hospital, yeah. a bank headquarters, a school. Uh, and, you know, what does that mean, you know, when the showpiece is, is something that, you know, we consider so essential, really, uh, to everyday life, everyday life in a city? So I want to talk, you mentioned hospitals, um, yeah. you know, I was listening to, and if those of you who are on the call haven't watched it, um, on Sultan, who's on the call, his uh, talk with you in the online cultural measure list, which is on YouTube, a really, really good watch if you want to check it out. Um, you talk about the hospital infrastructure and how that was, for me, as I told you before the call, that was really surprising thing because as a, somebody who's not an architect and is not familiar with urban planning, I was surprised that 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 infrastructure was uh, featured so heavily in the original plan. Um, can you talk a little bit about what um, what that means and the state of these hospitals today? And if you know if the if the plan was actually uh, actualized properly? Yeah, um, the Al Maktoum Hospital, so the one on your right, um, was uh, Dubai's first hospital, and it actually already existed before. Uh, Harris arrived, um, but he was already very interested in it. Uh, even when he, even though he was hired and and being brought to Dubai to talk about a town plan, um, my guess is, uh, in fact, no, I, it's not a guess. Um, the ruler of Dubai, Sheikh Rashid uh, bin Said Al Maktoum, uh, knew the hospital that Harris had designed and 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 kind of managed its kind of construction, really, a kind of project manager in Doha. He had a brochure of it uh, that I have reported. So he, he soon realizes that the person who is uh, about to draw this town plan is also the person who made this glorious new hospital that everyone's talking about in Doha and is making Doha seem like the place of uh, a benevolent state, a, a state that can provide for its people, a state that can, yeah, provide medical uh, um, services that are otherwise only available in India or in, in Europe. Um, and so that uh, already uh, hospital um, medical services are very much a kind of understood mechanism and understood infrastructure that can help um, not only, um, yeah, I guess they, they, medical infrastructure is a way to um, express that there is a, a location, there is a city, there is a state, and there is a ruler uh, who can provide uh, through the, the kind of amenities of that city. Um, I think that's already evident. And with Harris on board, there's now this chance to improve Al Maktoum Hospital. Um, which is in no way near the level of provisions in Doha. The Rashid Hospital on the left is the second hospital of Dubai, and Harris's uh, second, probably his second commission um, in the city. It's a, it's a similar layout as the one in Doha, uh, but not nearly as large uh, and not nearly as expensive either. Um, but Does, he. No, yeah. keep on going, keep on going. I was just going to say that. You know, this picture on the left is taken by a professional architectural mm -hmm. photographer. So he's trying to find some kind of architectural forms to excite the the architect who might be finding these images in an architecture magazine. But um, 
I don't think I'm insulting Harris when I say it's difficult to find these kinds of views of the architecture. Yeah. Um, he was working within strict budgets. Uh, and so even though this hospital had a rather high budget for the time, a lot of that money needed to go to the, the purchasing of, of the machinery and the technology inside of it. And so he was very much um, in tune with kind of how, how is architecture actually the framework for this technology, but also the services that are then provided through this technology. So um, speaking of resources, so this is taking place, um, you know, um, the original plan is taking place uh, in the first half of the 1960s. It comes out in 1960, and a lot of this work is being done in the first half of the 1960s. Um, in 1966, oil is discovered, um, which changes changes things. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the ambitions um, may have changed and how the work may have changed uh, in the second half of the 60s going into the 70s? Right. So, uh, yeah, so you're right that, that 66 is the moment when it is confirmed that Dubai has um, commercial amounts of, of oil to extract. Mm -hmm. It's not until 68, I believe, uh, that it actually begins to go on the market. And it's actually a very complicated moment. And I try to kind of deliver this in the book, but you know, there's this optimism about oil, you know, finally oil is coming on board, but then there are these kind of two things that are, you know, against it. Uh, one is, is that the British um, it, uh, quickly uh, state that they're, they're going to be leaving uh, the Trucial States as they were called. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other is that it's looking like the oil isn't going to be as much as they were hoping for, which means fewer profits. And so there's this kind of revved up uh, marketing game of, of expressing how Dubai is going to use this money. It was almost as if the money was going to be um, the profits to, from oil uh, were going to be used to kind of create this subsidized landscape of a business dealing, you know, kind of like one mm -hmm. big free zone of entrepreneurial opportunity. Uh, and so there's this package made of, of, of new projects uh, to come on board, uh, the expansion of the airport, Rashid Hospital is part of that, Port Rashid is, is part, part of that, uh, and also things like a sewage system, extending the roads. And so there's this true effort to show that all this money is going to be spent on, on creating this business friendly environment. Yeah. When in fact the city is, is being threatened. One that Abu Dhabi is going to ascend as the capital of the UAE. It has much more money and that Dubai is actually not going to have this petroleum profits that it had once hoped it would. Of course it does, but just not yeah. as much. So, you know, I, I put this on this, these two slides, so this was the original plan in 1960. And right. then I tried to do the scaling thing that may or may not work properly, but this is the, uh, the plan in that comes out in 1971, I believe. Right. Right. Um, and Harris is also behind this plan, correct? Correct. Does he, I mean, for, again, for those of us who are not as familiar with Dubai, walk me through the, the degree, maybe the magnitude to which this is more ambitious. Is this, you know, is this a, a, a leap for mankind or is this an <laughs> incremental step forward? And, and did residents feel it? I guess, I mean, it just, if you spoke to resident in 1975, would he, would he or she say, wow, this is really changing dramatically. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, first, the first plan is, is much more dramatic. Um, and it's also much more influential um, because really almost all of the roads that you see in that uh, early map, the 1960, sorry, plan, mm -hmm. the 1960 plan, almost all of those roads that you see uh, were actually um, executed. Um, the major ones that were not are these kinds of um, checkerboard looking areas on the bottom left. But mm -hmm. most of the roads that you see on the upper part were actually built. 
Um, whereas in the 1971 plan um, is actually a, a disappointment. It's a frustration. Um, it's, it's also a very confusing execution of a plan. Uh, the, the actual uh, illustrative plan that you have here is very different from what you actually read in the text. And you, I get the sense that, and this is my own reading of it, uh, without uh, too much to back me up other than the kind of uh, historical events happening is that Harris is a bit um, um, confused, uh, not confused, uh, but um, yeah, he's trying to kind of work with what's going on in the city. Again, it's a, it's a confusing time. Oil is coming in. 71 is also when, you know, this, this uh, plan comes out months before uh, the Federation of the UAE. So no one really knows how Dubai is going to, to survive. He doesn't have a lot of statistics on which to base uh, this plan. And it's really against um, really the, where the market was taking Dubai. So even though is it doesn't look like it, time in Dubai, like is sorry to interrupt is, yeah. is Harris spending a lot of time in Dubai? Does he live there part time? I mean, he does is not he live having there? a similar effect on other cities too, or is this the only city that he's really um, he no. is, he is not living there. Uh, he does have people, um, who are working for and with him who, um, live there for periods of time. He's coming frequently, um, around the, uh, late sixties, he's actually working on very large hospital projects elsewhere. And so he comes back just in time, uh, to build, to, to, to design and work on uh, Rashid hospital. And using that, you know, further, you know, kind of fattened up CV and, and medical architecture, just in time to, to use uh, that to help Dubai with, you know, uh, deploying these new petroleum profits. Uh, and that's at the similar time as this plan, really, uh, 1971. So um, you talk in, in uh, I'm going to quote another thing that you say, you say, Speaking about the 1971 plan, you say irony is, as John Harris designed the World Trade Center, um, which was being seen as, quote, out of town, yet its existence and ready availability of land on either side of the Abu Dhabi Road, which is now Sheikh Zayed Road, meant this area developed instead, leading to D Dubai's modern development. So can you talk a little bit about World Trade Center um, and, you know, the conception of it, the execution of it and its significance at the time? Sure. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty powerful project and, and, and it's significant on, on so many ways. I think it's the largest chapter of my book. So, um, to, to make it succinct as possible for today, um, it's, it's difficult to overestimate how important this project really was. Um, it was, a, a very late project, both for Harris and for uh, Sheikh Rashid, uh, who was the client, and uh, according to some sources, paid for it uh, in cash. Uh, you know, this is so. You know, th at this stage, uh, oil is uh, is doing well on on global markets, uh, and it increases in size, and, uh, height, a modest height uh, as it's going. Harris's first proposal for this uh, project. Uh, was actually the, the man in the striped shirt uh, walking uh, um, in the foreground in the picture um, was the uh, became the chief architect for this project, uh, Gordon Heald, uh, and he was a great help to me uh, in the book. Um, and he he tells this wonderful story, which I get in the book, which was he was actually looking at these kinds of mid-rise projects where it was a um, he was given the, the idea, the assignment to come up with an exhibition center. Uh, he goes, does some research, looking at what's going on in North America and Europe, and realizes this kind of trend of mid-rise hotel slash exhibition center um, offices combination yeah. parks going on. And he comes up with this kind of mid-rise version that uh, Harris is embarrassed almost to show to the ruler and the rest of his advisors because it's far too expensive, uh, according to him. But the meeting ends with the decision actually that 
the ruler, despite some of his advisors, truly want a tower. And a tower is decided upon uh, really because it, it, it signifies something. And this is the kind of first evidence that I have in the relationship between Harris and Dubai's ruler that architecture is um, being chosen for a kind of uh, an expressive form really uh, at this stage. And on top of that, it's a place for exhibiting. So it's at once an exhibit to the rest of the world about what Dubai is and can be, but it's also a place of, of housing exhibitions. So this is, um, the argument is that this is the original showpiece. This is the first sort of showpiece. Um, no, it's actually the, 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 actually the projects with uh, in the book that Harris's other projects were also described as showpieces. Mm, interesting. But okay. yes, this is the ultimate showpiece of yeah. course, of all of them. And just, just for context, so this is, uh, Sheikh Zayed road, right. um, in 1979. So when, when you say it's out of town, this is, this is this, what that sort of looks and feels like. I want to talk a little bit about, you said when you started the book, Harris was still alive. Mm. Um, did he recognize Dubai's growth? Um, did he feel like it was still, the, the DNA of his work was still there? Uh, I, I did get to meet him. It, it wasn't a meeting where we could really uh, get into uh, topics like that. I think it was, it was a bit, uh, uh, he had had a couple strokes um, and though lucid at times, it, it, we didn't really have a chance uh, to speak like that. Um, and it's difficult, um, you know, but I do have uh, notes from talks that he gave, especially through the 80s and 90s, uh, but not from the early 2000s when we really see, you know, things take off in, in a certain other kind of, of direction. But that is also something I bring up in the book where I, I, I did interview this, um, a, a political agent, so one, the highest ranking British official uh, in Dubai. And it was a really strange conversation that I, I maybe I should write up a bit more. Um, but one of the things he said to me, and I quote him in the book, is, you know, if he had known that Dubai was going to turn out like this, he would have never been a part of it. And he was he was the political agent when you know Dubai was uh, actually laid its first asphalt uh, tarmac roads, asphalt roads. Um, and so there's, I think that's a really you know, he's, he's it, speaking on behalf of Harris or on behalf of himself, on behalf of himself. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, you know, that there's this idea that, you know, you can be modern, but only so modern, you know, there, that there's an ex expectation that it would always be behind. Yeah. Cause I mean, interestingly enough, like when I look at slides like this, right. Um, mm. slides like this, right. I, I think to myself, okay, you know, there's no way he could see his DNA, his work, the, you know, the, um, the, re the results of his work, the foundation that he laid doesn't seem to be um, even recognizable. However, when you think about the World Trade Center, that does seem to be, that does seem to be the initial gene, right? this idea of, okay, we are going to build a showpiece tower that is not only exhibiting a, mm. does not only serve as a show, but actually serves as a venue for shows, right? And it is a, it is, um, it's commanding, it's large, it is, um, it you know, it demands your attention. Um, and it, it seems as though that's the, that's the first Lego, you know? that gets put in. I, I make the argument in the book that th th there is a lead up to this. And I, okay. I, I agree with you to, to a certain extent. I guess I would only push back in the sense that Harris was learning along the way how to do this and how to do it in Dubai. Um, and the other projects were, you know, as much about providing services as they were about showing Dubai's progress. Yeah. Um, uh, and this is really the kind of moment when you see a clearly delineated site. It's all compact within it. You know, it's referring to itself. You could almost 
live, you, you could live here uh, if you were living in a hotel and never see the rest of the city. Uh, it had a post office, it had restaurants, uh, it had a theater. Um, so yeah, it was also a kind of example of all the kind of interior spaces um, that begin to be expected uh, from any downtown city, really, you know? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, uh, before we switch into the, the Q and a, the quick Q and a, I want to talk to you a little bit about this photo that you also mm -hmm. uh, showed in your, um, your presentation on Sultan's, uh, online majlis. Um, I love this photo, especially now insofar as vaccines are being administered uh, globally, but in Dubai in particular, can you tell the story of this photo a little bit? Sure. Um, in the conversation with Sultan, um, I, I suggested that I believe this photo was uh, from Rama Shukla, but I think it's from Nur Ali Rashid. And I, if I had had a little bit of time, I could have quickly checked. Uh, but I love this image too. Um, this is um, a doctor. Uh, so the, the white British man in the vest and tie is the only one I can identify here. That's Desmond McCauley. Uh, and he was the general medical officer of Al Maktoum Hospital. Um, and what we see here is he's giving vaccines uh, and to um, possibly, uh, this was a setup which is described elsewhere, but Macaulay was known to set up his table with his vaccines um, at the, uh, the creek, at the harbor. So people who are actually arriving by boat were being vaccinated um, uh, I, I'm not even quite sure for what they're getting vaccinated for. Maybe malaria, maybe diphtheria, maybe a kind of compound of, of many different things. Um, but it's, it's once again, back to this idea of, that we were just talking about, Mikey, which is this, this combination of providing a service, but mm -hmm. showing you're providing the service. Uh, so yes, there is this uh, completely efficient way of, as they're getting off the boat, give them a vaccine, like it, it secures yeah. and makes the city healthy, but it's also a way of showing that the yeah, city it's, it's is healthy. Yeah, it's a communication. Yeah. You got to have the piece, but you got to have the show. Okay. Exactly. Let's have, um, <laughs> let's have these four quick questions and then we'll open it up because I think we have great questions. Uh, Joy said uh, smallpox. She very well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of course, there's no malaria vaccine. Yeah. Uh, smallpox is, is probably the answer. That sounds right. Um, Maybe diphtheria, Joy? I don't know. I don't know if there was one for that. Okay. What are you reading or watching right now? Uh, a lot. Uh, I, I have this bad habit of reading many things at once. Um, but uh, one thing for pleasure I'm reading is um, Alif Shafak's um, Architects, The Architect's Apprentice. I'm kind of mm. sucker for historical fiction. Uh, but uh, a really nice book that I've started uh, maybe a couple of days ago uh, was a new book by Ziad Fakmi called um, um, Street Sounds. It's about, uh, it's an or oral history, so a history of sound of Cairo. And it's just, it's, it's almost wow. therapeutic uh, because it's, it's, yeah, it's, he's trying to bring us away from being so focused on the visual. Uh, so I highly recommend it. I haven't gotten through it. Have yet. you read Reem Khurshid's essay about listening to Cairo? Yes. In fact, I, yeah. I, I suggested to her that she should write a, a review of uh, Street Sounds. Oh, so cool. Okay. Um, who would uh, you love to shadow for a day past or present? <laughs> Maybe it's Harris. <laughs> <laughs> um, at, at a time, yeah. I, I was thinking about this. Uh, the... You're you like, know, get him away from me. I'm sick. Of <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should leave him alone. You know, give him, I should leave him a good, let, let him rest peacefully in his grave. Um, yeah. No, actually there's a, on my pandemic walks, I have this across the bridge from me, there's this old kind of early 18th century building and, you know, thick lead glass. Uh, and there's this man and I finally figured out he's, he's building instruments. Um, and he's actually building bows for violins and cellos. Oh, wow. and, and I was thinking about him working late at night and this kind of very slow process and not to kind of celebrate or romanticize about craft, 
But I would just, I would just be very curious how, maybe I need to shadow him for like a week or a year just to kind of yeah. get into that flow of human to human contact of delivering, making something and delivering it to someone specifically for them. You sound like somebody in the middle of COVID. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just need human contact. <laughs> Just one person, right? On a Zoom call, one person. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What do people most misunderstand about your work or your line of work? What do you think people most misunderstand? I like this question. It's yeah. a, uh, I think I'll go with um, the fact that, you know, when you talk, talk about Dubai so often, I sometimes get people, you know, who approach me after I've written or, or spoken and they finally you're showing that dubai you know is a leader in progress is a leader in you know ad, ad, advancement of humans and then someone else will you know accuse me of being that champion and i i i sometimes think that people are either thinking that i'm being very critical of the city or being its champion uh but i find it difficult to find people who agree that i'm i'm maintaining a critical eye sure yeah I would, uh, that would have been my guess. Well, I think I, in your, uh, in your praise, not defense, but in your praise, I think you do a very good job of that. Thanks. Um, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? So many, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right yeah. now, um, I'm very inspired uh, by an artist uh, that I just gotten to know actually in the last couple of years. And I'm very honored to, to get to write about him. Uh, he's a Syrian architect, um, uh, sorry, Syrian artist, um, Herer Sarkisian. Uh, he's based in London and he's a photographer. And again, it's maybe this is pandemic related, Mikey, again, like, uh, yeah. but he's, a, he's, he's trained both in kind of apprentice tradition of photography, uh, but also, um, you know, formal art education. And there's just something very kind of, you know, photography, we think of very much as an instantaneous art, but there's something very labor intensive about the way he looks and the way he continues to go back to subjects. Uh, so yeah, that would be my name, Herrera Sarkisian. Cool. That's great. Um, okay. We're going to open up the questions. We have three questions so far. I suspect we'll have more. Um, Yada, I'm asking you to unmute. Um, hi, uh, thank you so much for this amazing um, Africa conversation. Um, so my question was basically, I mean, other people already answered. Uh, how did uh, Sheikh Rashid find um, that vision without any capital? Where did the money come from to begin the plan to be like with like everything that's happening? So um, yeah, that's all. Sorry, I, I was just no. caught off guard. <laughs> no, thanks, Yada. No, I think sure. it's a great question. Thanks. Uh, well, um, yeah, where did he get the money basically to start with? Uh, is, um, uh, there are a couple sources. Uh, one, he actually does pay Harris uh, for the visit, even uh, though it was definitely something that was stage managed by the British government. Um, and a lot of the projects at first uh, war uh, had uh, loans involved with them. So Rashid Hospital was based on a merchant loan with British Bank. Um, a, a lot of the early money was actually coming from his um, um, son-in-law, who was the Emir of Qatar, who was putting a lot of money uh, into uh, Dubai and actually uh, has for himself a, a, a palace built on the water, uh, which you can actually see in the master plan. So that would be a, a quick answer. Cool. That's great. Um, Sabine is next. I'll ask you to, un I'm asking you to unmute. Hi there. Um, that Hi. was a great presentation. Thanks. Um, to be honest with you, I'm just writing up my thesis and I'm using your book, even though it's so last minute. I wish you'd come up with that like a year earlier. It would have been so, so helpful. Tell me um, about it. <laughs> <laughs> but out of curiosity, okay, in, in one of your podcasts, I, I can't recall which one, you did mention that you never visited Dubai whilst writing your book. No, 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 that's not true. Um, okay, I, I, I remember hearing it clearly and, and that led me to be very curious because I was like, well, how do you feel that you you um, betray a narrative that is balanced 
um, fair, uh, and I'm playing the devil's advocate here, without getting a, a perspective from other stakeholders in Dubai, like say the government, the, mm -hmm. the previous people who worked there during that time, if they're alive. And I know you did say that the archives were not publicly accessible, and I agree yeah. with you because I was there in last year doing my research, and I was having a really hard time. So yeah, it's really a, a kind of unfortunate situation, huh? Um, um, yeah, I've I've been um, visiting Dubai uh, for the last fifteen years, um, and even as a visitor, though I I don't try to claim that I'm, I'm from Dubai or, or that I can know it as a resident. Um, and I, I think for me, the, the, um, the important thing was that, that I wrote the book and that I present my work um, as an architect, um, that I am as any other kind of consultant uh, who might have been hired uh, to, to work in, in that city as if it were any other city that where one could be. Um, other stakeholders um, too, and, and that, uh, that is also part of it. Uh, so no, I did not have very much access uh, to, uh, let's say, uh, influential families uh, who um, also definitely sh helped shape the city. And I, I bring this up, you've read the book, uh, but I bring this up in, at the at the, the start that, that this is a a, a a very serious void in in the book. Uh, nevertheless, my history is not an entire history, and I s sincerely hope there are people um, who do have access to these kinds uh, of documents. Uh, Nora Lori um, has a recent book where she does have access to some. Um, uh, documents, early documents from the ruler's office, uh, which have been uh, kind of very insightful, um, looking what she's looking into kind of the notion of citizenship in Dubai. Um, I think I answered, is, is anything else? Yeah, no, no, you, you did, you did answer it. And, and I agree with most of what you said in terms of um, having access, access to, to um, a, a bunch of information that would have been so, so useful. And probably when you were writing your book and whilst I'm writing my thesis, um, are you okay if you could, you know, maybe pop it in the chat message, what, what her, this person's name was again, please? Uh, I who, uh, yeah. I could just look them up. That'll She's be amazing. Great. I really, uh, her work is, uh, uh, I think the book is called Offshore Citizenship. Okay. But I'm not sure. It might, something like that. All right. I'll look it up. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sabine. Um, okay. We got two more questions. Uh, Joy? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering whether there was ever any pushback on this vision of Dubai. I mean, was were there people who did not want the city to be transformed into this sort of, you know, what, with a lot of hindsight, is sort of very 1960s development model, a sort of car oriented, big tall buildings, <laughs> modern style. Yeah, yeah. You know, screw our past, get rid of our past. We're no longer a desert city, whatever. You know, I just now I'm sure a lot of people would push back, but this is, you know, 50, 60 years later. So I'm wondering whether anybody thought that way about it then. Uh, there was some really interesting pushback, which I get in uh, to in the book, um, but not from Dubai, uh, from another British official uh, working, I believe, out of Beirut. Uh, and he's looking at it from a planning perspective, so not in the terms of uh, sensibility that you're, you're discussing um, or asking about. Um, I don't see much of that, but what you do start to see is the, the, the direction of the city begins to move away from where the city has been built up. And that largely has to do because um, the ruling family can't purchase rights to the property uh, from the people who, who claim it. Um, so they move further out, Port Rasha and World Trade Center, these kinds of areas where it's, it's a sparser, sparser population, they can more easily purchase the land or they, or they can even just claim it because it's um, not you know, being explicitly claimed by someone else. But you don't get a sense. There's a really nice piece um, in a, a scholar gave me a, an article from Bahrain looking at Dubai's development of the World Trade Center. 
uh, and I got this in just at the last moment at the end of the chapter where Bahrain is, uh, there's an article in, in the Bahraini paper about, and using the World Trade Center as an example of Western architecture, uh, you know, being placed where it shouldn't be essentially. Uh, and this is, I'd say mid seventies, which I found really fascinating. Great. Thanks, Joy. Um, Thank you, Joy. We have another question from Hind. Hi. Hi, Todd. <laughs> um, my question is related to uh, currently, like especially since during pandemic, there's been a lot of talk about the 15-minute city, and I would, I and I, I think about that a lot. And I, and if in the past during the days of Harris, you know, if that was a thing, I feel it was maybe achievable in a city like Dubai. Do you think a fifteen? Do you think Dubai can become a fifteen-minute city if, if that is something um, city planners of uh, now would consider? Well, you know, the fifteen-minute city is very similar to um, uh, ideas of the neighborhood unit, um, which was a very standard town planning concept that the British helped to promote and and also to distribute throughout the world. And you, there are actually neighborhood units in the 1960 plan and they don't come about as Harris had proposed. And so there, there was something there. Um, but yeah, uh, I agree with a kind of sense of Hin's question that it's very difficult to imagine Dubai as a 15 minute city, namely you could get anywhere you need within 15 minutes. But I also find it striking that recent development in the city has been very much uh, driven by this idea of that sometimes called island urbanism, where people live and keep to their, not their neighborhood unit, but to their development. So whether you live in the Emirates Hills or in the Jumeirah Gardens or the, you know, da, 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 there's people tend to more, more so, I think, in my experience, and maybe yours is different than, than 10 years ago, people stick to those areas, uh, almost though to the, well, I think to the uh, detriment of, of the rest of the city. Thanks so much, Hind. Uh, Todd, we are just coming up yeah. on the hour. This was really, really fun. Um, well, thank you. I want to thank everyone who has joined the call. I've posted two links into the chat. The first is a feedback question form that asks the very simple question, was this good? Uh, and if you can answer that, that would be great. And then if you'd like to support us and keep us going and growing, consider becoming a Patreon. We are honored to have people like Todd be one of our patrons and um, uh, allow us to keep these events going. Um, so thank you so much. We host events, as I said, three times a week. Our Instagram is very active. Uh, check out the podcast, check out our YouTube page and our library online. And Todd, thank you so much. This was really fun. Thank you, Mikey. I appreciate having me here. And go buy his book. Check it out. It's <laughs> going to be fun. Okay, everybody. Take care. Bye -bye. Have a good day or night, wherever you are. Thank you for joining in, everyone.